When I was a kid in the early 2000s, online gaming wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Part of the reason was that high-speed internet wasn't common at the time. I remember the one and only time I tried to play Tribes online on my dad's dial-up connection. It was basically a slideshow. But there was one kind of online game that didn't demand tons of bandwidth. Months. Today, we have MMORPGs, but before World of Warcraft and the critically acclaimed MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV, which has a free trial and includes the entirety of A Realm Reborn and the award-winning Heavensward expansion up to level 60 with no restrictions on playtime, we had MUDs, or multi-user dungeons. MUDs are text-based online games in which a number of players interact in real time. Basically, MUDs are to single-player text adventures like Zork as MMOs are to graphical RPGs. Before we had the term MMORPG, people actually called those kinds of games graphical MUDs. Sidebar. There's a huge range of online text-based games and a lot of different terms used to describe them. MUSH stands for Multi-User Shared Hallucination and typically refers to rules-light virtual spaces more akin to chat rooms than games. MUX Multi-user experience is sometimes used for these kinds of spaces too. MU, somewhat confusingly, stands for MUD Object Oriented, which refers to programs with powerful tools that allow users to alter and expand the server with text commands. I'm mostly just gonna use the term MUD here to keep things simple. First MUD was called just that, MUD, but it's often known as Essex MUD since it ran on the University of Essex in England's network. It was developed by then student Roy Trebshaw in 1978, who later handed development over to Richard Bartle. You had to be on the university network to play it, and it was only online on weekends and from 2 to 8 a.m. on weekdays. But it must have seemed pretty cool at the time. Then, in 1980, the University of Essex connected their network to the proto-internet, ARPANET, and Essex Mud became the first online multiplayer role-playing game. Essex Mud shut down in 1987, but the idea had caught on, and MUDs proliferated throughout the mid to late 80s. The programs began to become more sophisticated owing to advances in communications and computer technology. In 1989, Avalon The Legend Lives became the first MUD to do away with the hourly resets that had been a feature of early MUDs, making it the first persistent online game world. Avalon's still running today, making it the longest continually running online role-playing game in history. I started playing MUDs in the early 2000s. EverQuest, the first commercially successful 3D MMORPG, had been out since 1999, and the sixth generation of game consoles was just coming out. So why play an online text-based game? Well, online games were still a novelty to most people. They were expensive, requiring you to invest in a powerful computer and often a high-speed internet connection. My dad had a dial-up internet connection and an old beige tower running Windows 95. We had console games, but MUDs were appealing for their own reasons. They were free, they offered seemingly endless worlds, and most importantly, They give you the chance to meet all kinds of new people. The lack of any real visuals, aside from the occasional ASCII art, meant that MUDs didn't demand much in the way of bandwidth or processing power. Since they were entirely text-based, they usually ran even better than the image-heavy websites of the time. And there were a lot of MUDs. Again, since they didn't contain graphics or even sounds in most cases, it was relatively easy to program your own MUD by modifying an existing code base like TinyMUD or DQMUD and stick it on a server. That meant there were hundreds of MUDs ranging wildly in their worlds, mechanics, player accounts, and approaches to roleplay. Anyone could host their own MUD, and anyone with the address could use a Telnet program to dial in and roll a character. Sites like MUD Connector provided details for each MUD, making it easy to browse and find one you were interested in. Since this was basically the Wild West days of the internet, unlicensed MUDs based on commercial properties were everywhere. For example, back in the 2000s, I was really into Star Wars. I was first turned on to MUDs by a few of my friends who were playing on one called Star Wars Legends of the Jedi, which somehow still exists. It was unique in a lot of ways. Mods could see all player interactions and enforce roleplay, which meant you had to stay in character at all times. Break character and a mod would sometimes literally bring down the thunder on you. The game mechanics themselves forced roleplay too. If you were a Wookiee, you couldn't speak basic. So anyone who didn't devote a skill slot to learning the language would see your speech as just a lot of Chewbacca noises. Legends of the Jedi also had permadeath, which was a pretty novel concept to me at the time, especially for a multiplayer game. If you died on a friendly planet, you could be brought back to life in a cloned body for a nominal fee. But if you bit it out in the deserts of Tatooine, or you were blown up in a space battle, then that was it. Say goodbye to Desh Randar, your definitely original level 50 character. The permadeath plus the enforced roleplay gave Legends of the Jedi a feel I've never really seen replicated in any other game. 
It was like playing a game of D&D where the rules handled themselves and the DM's only job was to watch and make sure everyone was committed to the story. It was totally wild and of course couldn't scale beyond a certain level. When more than a few dozen players were online at once, it was hard for the volunteer mod staff to keep track of everything. Not all mods were set up this way though. Plenty were roleplay optional, much like today's MMOs, where players are free to roleplay if they like, but it isn't expected of them. That was the case on a number of Dragon Ball mods I played on. These mods were especially appealing at the time because there were basically no Dragon Ball video games available in North America back then, and there were definitely none that let you make your own character. The idea of having your own Dragon Ball hero and fighting alongside Goku and his friends was an appealing one. And these mods were all slightly different, running on different code bases and with different balancing systems. You could play as humans, Namekians, Saiyans, Icers, or Changelings, which is what we called the Frieza race at the time, and more. There was roleplay on at least one of the Dragon Ball mods I played on, Dragon Ball World Reloaded. Unlike Legend of the Jedi, it took place on public channels. But you couldn't just roleplay as an unkillable superhero by no-selling all of your opponent's moves. First of all, nobody would want you around if you did that. Second, the outcomes of roleplayed battles had to be determined in advance by in-game fights using PvP combat. You'd still get childish people, and honestly, literal children too, who wouldn't play along. But it was a cool experience to build a shared mythos with the other players. Dragon Ball Z World Reloaded even had in-universe lore explaining the shift from an earlier incarnation of the mud when the original servers went down as the universe collapsing and a few characters escaping to a new one with new rules, planets, and people. I played the same character over several years who went through a series of harrowing experiences. Losing an arm in a battle against an evil Namekian and having it replaced with a robotic one, turning evil under the influence of a nefarious wizard, and struggling to fight powerful Saiyans as a simple human. We went through a lot together, and when Dragon Ball Xenoverse came out over a decade later and finally let players make their own Dragon Ball characters, I recreated my old mud character from one last adventure. Thinking about all of this now is bittersweet because I've long since lost touch with everyone I knew from these muds. Even the text logs that I once kept, because most mud clients could automatically log your sessions for you, are gone, stuck on an old rotten hard drive inside that old beige computer tower that disappeared sometime after I went to college. There's practically no evidence that muds like Dragon Ball Z World Reloaded even existed anymore unless you dig into the internet archive. Of course, not all muds were based on existing franchises. Plenty were unique fantasy worlds that crafted their own stories and lore. Some of these, like the influential Delgren Mu, no longer exist. Others, like IKEA, have been running since 1995 and are still going strong, with updates and new content being added all the time. MUDs remain an important part of internet and video game history, and not just because they were the predecessors to MMOs. Some of the earliest studies on online interactions were done on MUDs. In 1993, journalist Julian Dibble wrote A Rape in Cyberspace, or How an Evil Clown, a Haitian Trickster Spirit, Two Wizards, and a Cast of Dozens Turned a Database into a Society, for The Village Voice, that got academic and activist Lawrence Lessig into the field of what was then called cyberspace. And while things have changed significantly since the early 2000s, MUDs still have a special kind of appeal to them. Text-based games can immerse us in a world far more deeply than the most realistic graphics can, partly because they demand the use of our imagination, and partly because it's easier to create a mechanically deep game when you're not worried about visuals. Plus, many mods are playable by the visually impaired using screen readers. So if all that sounds good to you and you want to check one out, mudstats.com tracks over 700 active mods with player counts and genre information in real time. That's it for this episode of Forgotten Worlds. If you played on a mud or if there are any online communities you'd like me to discuss in a future episode, let me know in the comments. Um, and please like and subscribe to Fanbyte. Until next time, stay safe out there in cyberspace.